Hi everyone and welcome to Crime Explorer Shack. I'm your host Sherry and I'm joined by my co-host Dawn and you'll notice this week's intro is a little bit different. Yes, we're changing it up for Halloween. What better way to go into Halloween than with some good old-fashioned ghost stories? We're diving into a few of my favorites from the book, The 13 Alabama Ghost and Jeffrey. So sit back and enjoy some folklore legend from my home state of Alabama. So let's go to the Crime Explorer Shack. into a fun week since this is Halloween and I am joined by Dawn. Hello. Yay. I love Halloween. It's my very favorite. Yes. It's just like the beginning of fall and fun, family. Yes. All of it. Yes. 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 Well, so this is a um, listener suggested episode and you know how we love those songs. Oh so. my gosh, yes. All the input is great. Yes. This one just kind of like takes me back to my childhood. There was this book that was in the library at school when I was growing up. And it was called The 13 Alabama Ghost and Jeffrey. And Jeffrey. And Jeffrey. Okay. It was written by Catherine Tucker Wyndham and Margaret Gillis Fye, and it was first published in 1969. Jeffrey was actually a ghost in Miss Catherine Wyndham's house. Oh. Yes. She named him Jeffrey because her son kind of just said, this is my friend Jeffrey. Oh, my gosh. He was a friendly ghost. <laughs> and she named him, they just called him Jeffrey. Okay. So I don't know how many of you actually saw the post I made on social media that was announcing this week's episode, but the picture actually was uh, one of the girls, it was a reporter that stayed at Miss Catherine's house. And the little image the little cloud that's in the background is jeffrey that was captured in that photo um, was she staying there just like how people do now as like an <laughs> investigative type of thing or was she just happen to stay there she was just actually there were some kids that were actually visiting and they were some young people were visiting the house and they decided to just kind of like play on a Ouija board, which oh, you know freaks me out. Yeah. And they were trying to contact the ghost. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. And so they developed the photos that they took that night and this shadowy human like shape was seen beside Nikki, the girl, the, the reporter in the photograph. So right after it was taken, they contacted Miss um, Margaret Gillis Fye, who is one of the publishers of the 13 Ghost, with uh, Miss Catherine. She was asked about Jeffrey. And out of that meeting, Miss Catherine and Margaret decided that they would come up and write about the 13 Alabama Ghost and Jeffrey. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So um, that's how this whole book came about. Wyndham said that although there are just numerous ghost stories throughout the South and throughout Alabama, she wanted to choose the stories for her book that had basically entertained many generations and were kind of kid friendly, family friendly, and were just kind of a, a treasured part of Southern folklore, so to speak. And um she wanted something that would not only just describe the ghost, but also community and the lifestyles and the people who actually reported the haunting too. She didn't want to just limit it to 
the the tragic story. She wanted the whole history, which you know you and I are intrigued by all of right. it. Yeah. So, and she also faced a little bit of controversy being here in the South. You know, back in that time, telling ghost stories and stuff like that from some of the conservative Christians. They were, you know, they they didn't believe that this was, you know, compatible with their Christian beliefs and. Wyndham did a interview with the Birmingham News and she responded to all these claims and criticism by saying, you know, hey, if I'm going to hell, I can't deny that because it's not for me to judge. It won't be for telling ghost stories. I have far greater shortcomings than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I just love Miss Catherine. Yeah, her, good for her. Her attitude about the whole thing, you know, it was just you know, she's going to do her thing. And I was like, you know, that's awesome. You know, yeah. do do your thing and tell the truth and get the word out there. Cause you're going to have critics no matter what you do. You, oh, know. <laughs> you know, that's so interesting too, that that was going on that far back because like even nowadays with Halloween, my sister teaches and they don't have Halloween parties anymore. Like they have a party, but nobody can dress up and, it's just like so crazy to think that this has been going on for a long time. Oh, absolutely. I know. And, you know, this, like I said, this book was first published in 69 and it, it recalls some of Alabama's most ghoulish and eerie ghost legends, it, but it's a suspenseful type or style that's not gruesome, but in a treasured form that can be related to, to children and adults. Because yeah. I, you know, when I think about it, I think about having to be on a wait list to go get that in the library because every child wanted that book. And I can't tell you how many times I went to check that out. And how impressive is that, that a child craved reading that type of book or craved reading at all? Yeah. So it was like spooky, eerie kind of? Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. It is very suspenseful. And Jeffrey is like the most famous ghost in Alabama. When you think about Alabama ghost legends, you know, you think of Jeffrey in, here. So the first story that I want to tell from that book, of course, Jeffrey was, you know, we know he came from Miss Catherine's house and her house was the Wyndham house really not sure uh, all the details about how he came to be. He just showed up there one day. She said that there was just a whole lot of noise, racket that came in. It sounded like a, a clatter. And then over the next couple of days, her, her little boy started saying something about his friend, Jeffrey. So he just showed up. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So that's how he came to be in the Wyndham house in uh, Selma, Alabama. So that's, that's Jeffrey. Um, and even before Miss Catherine died in 2011, her car tag said Jeffrey. Oh my gosh. That's funny. <laughs> yes. Yes. So she was a legend and she, she, you know, loved Jeffrey. The, the story I'm going to tell about another house is the Drish house. The Drish house is in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And um, this story goes back to 1817. Oh my um, gosh. Yes. There was three or four brothers, Owen brothers, and their sister who was Miss Miseries Sarah McKinney who was a recent widow who moved to Tuscaloosa from the Norfolk district of Virginia. They all traveled to Tuscaloosa and they're covered wagons. They had just all kind of, you know, very um, eccentric furniture, heirlooms. And this, some of this furniture just was proudly displayed in this Drish mansion, but that was later on. In Tuscaloosa, Miseries Sarah McKinney met and married Dr. John Drish, who was a physician who had lost his wife a couple of years before. Well, Dr. Drish 
had one daughter, Catherine, who was a beautiful, just very gorgeous, elegant, classy young lady who was heartbroken because she had had a love affair with somebody that her father did not approve of. So Catherine was forbidden to see this man. She was in love with him, but her father stepped in and said, this is not happening. And he forced her basically into a marriage with a man that she was absolutely miserable with. And she lost her mind. Oh, yeah. She just, they, she went insane. Wow. So about 1930, Dr. John and Miss Sarah Drish built their Drish mansion on the outskirts of Tuscaloosa, which it's now in a residential business section on 17th Street between Greensboro and Queen City Avenues. And it was a imposing plantation style home and it was probably best described as a, a southern colonial type house with some greek and italian type influence mm. um, it had a very wide porch with huge columns that extended across the rear and um, its front had two ionic columns on each side of the large square tower. So I'm going to send you some pictures of what it looked like back then, Dawn, and I want you to tell me what your first impression of it is. Okay. Let's see. And I'm going to post these um, actually on the website too for everybody to kind of get a good idea of what this mansion looked like back oh, in the wow. day. Wow. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Imagine that in 1830. Yeah. I wondered if they had been to Italy or something, if that's what inspired them. You know, I'm not sure if it was, you know, them or the um, architect kind of talked them into it or it was a combination maybe. But I mean, that is just amazing to me for 1830. Oh my you know? gosh. Yeah. It is beautiful. I wonder if that's, it's hard to tell if it's stained glass on those, you know, second and third floors. Oh, I, you know, I don't think so, but I don't know back in the day. It, it may be actually no. be. I don't, it's um, hard to tell, but it, th there's definitely like detail or something on those windows. It's so eccentric. I mean, yeah. just so, like you said, so detailed and that, those two ionic columns on each side of the large mm -hmm. square tower that rose to the middle of the porch. And then that main entrance, see that tower in the front, that's the main entrance of the home is through that arched doorway wow. on the ground level of that three story tower. And above that entrance is a square room and it opens into a huge upstairs hall and a winding stairway that leads from this room to the square tower room, which stands above the level of the flat roof. So there's a flat roof up there. Okay. At, at the rear of the large downstairs hall is a horseshoe staircase that rises in a graceful curve to the landing where the straight flights and one on each side ascended mm -hmm. to the upstairs hall. Well, Miss Drish was obviously a woman with excellent taste and she had, you know, great financial means. She loved, she loved to show that she had great taste in decorating. She had red velvet carpets that covered the floors and she had imported lace curtains that hung at all the windows and this, she loved candles. The soft glow of candles danced in the crystal prisms of the candle opera on the marble mantel. At the main entrance to the estate was a, a shelter for the slaves whose duty it was to open and close the heavy gates that led into the property. And the property had a long driveway that was surrounded by shrubs and evergreens. Well, I mean, it was just the gardens just 
fields and just acres of land that everything was used. Just flowers, fruit orchards, woods, pines. This elaborate estate required a lot of attention. Well, Dr. Drish was unfortunately a very poor manager. <laughs> so, you know, it's a good thing that Mrs. Drish had a, a brain for money. Well, it was <laughs> widely reported that he gambled and drank, and he did both of those very poorly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, often the story would go that he would take a boatload of cotton from his plantation down to the river and go to Mobile, Alabama, to sell it. And then weeks later, he would return to Tuscaloosa with nothing to show for it except a terrible hangover and a remorseful conscience. And so oh he would ap God. apologize and beg Miss Sarah for forgiveness. And usually he had to be put to bed and just carefully nursed back to health, you know, to get over his hangover and carousing he did while he was in Mobile. And uh, this also, is the guy that she was fixed up with that she was forced to marry. No, this is Miss Sarah, the mother. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is the doctor that was doing this. Yeah, that's why I thought maybe it yeah. wasn't because I'm like, how mm -hmm. is he finding time to no, be a Ms. doctor? Yeah, Miss Cat, uh, his daughter. She's she's crazy. So Miss Sarah's kind of having to take care of her. Okay. So yeah, um, and it was after one of these trips tormented by his own guilt and by sadness over Catherine's increasing madness that he broke from the restraining arms of his servants that was trying to hold him up and get him to bed that he stumbled on that curved stairway mm -hmm. and shrieked and he, he stumbled and he failed to his death. Oh, wow. In the house. So, for many years after his death, the slaves on the plantation often claimed that they heard Dr. Drish and his stumbling footsteps followed by his agonizing cry. Hmm. But before his burial, his body lay in state in the house, surrounded by candles burning and the same candles that were to provide another restless spirit with a reason for haunting the Drish house. Miss, Mrs. Drish, after the funeral, asked that these very candles be put away and be saved until her death when they were to be lighted again around her coffin. So following Dr. Drish's death, Mrs. Drish's niece, Virginia Owen Green, and her husband, Thomas Finley Green, and their children came to live with her in this big house. And they were all happy because this house was once again filled with laughter and, and happiness with all these little kids running around. Mm -hmm. And and it also made Catherine, who had become more silent and withdrawn, kind of come back to her senses, not seem so mad, you know. So through the years, Miss Trish maintained uh, an interest in the happenings and she wanted to see, you know, what was going on in the world. She subscribed to all the periodicals and stuff, but she insisted that she know what the, the most recent ceremonies were for um, funerals and the such. And she just made sure that everybody knew she wanted to, had those candles that was around her husband lit around hers. Mm -hmm. So on the day that she died, one of the old servants reminded Mrs. Green of the dead woman's almost obsessive wish. Mm -hmm. She said, and this is a quote, Old Miss said a hundred times she wants them same candles burn. The servant prompted Mrs. Green with well, a niece made a search, but not a very diligent one for those candles, but they were not found. Miss Green had not been present for Dr. Drish's funeral and didn't see any real importance. Um, she just kind of thought her aunt was being a little bit crazy. Mm -hmm. 
And she kind of dismissed it as a whim, you know. And the servant just kept repeating, we got to find them candles. Old Miss is going to walk if we don't find them candles and burn them like she say. <laughs> Miss, old Miss is sure going to walk. Well, the candles were not found. And Miss Drish, though given a proper funeral, was buried without the candles having been burned. And soon afterwards, strange appearances of the fire in the tower room and sightings for many years caused the occupants of the house to be ousted from their bed and false fire alarms to go off. Oh, my gosh. So some of the people tried to find scientific explanations for these fiery lights in the tower, but the servants had no doubt that Ole Miss was up there walking around and had come back to her home to burn her own death candles. Oh my gosh. And most Alabama homes are content to provide habitation for only one ghost, but the Drish house has several ghostly inhabitants. Not only both Dr. Drish and Miss Drish have returned, but another, and in some respects, even stranger presence have manifested itself there. Some say that Catherine is there and, you know, finds it necessary to stay in the upstairs bedroom. The nieces or the great nieces have possibly been there. So the house today still stands. It has gone through several things over the years. It was once the Jimerson School, right after it had stopped being used for residents. You know, people stopped buying it to live in. There was a uh, Mr. Cochran bought it and People would run into town and pull him from whatever he was doing and tell him his house was on fire and he'd get home and it would not be on fire. Oh my gosh. So yeah, it was used for a, an auto parts. It was used for the Jimerson school. It was used for a church. Now it is actually used for private parties, weddings, and events, and it has been restored, and it is absolutely stunning. I'm sending you some of the new pictures now. Yeah. This is a wedding. I am just like, weddings, Christmas parties. Oh, wow. And it is absolutely stunning. So I'm going to put all of this on there. I'm going to link to the website that people can actually book for the weddings and parties on there, because I just think it's just amazing that this place is still standing and all of its glory. And they mm. actually put history on the website about it too. So it's, you know, we've got a, we've got a treasure here in Alabama and in Tuscaloosa. And it's just fascinating to me that the Drish house went through all of that. But if somebody tells you, that they want something done for their funeral. Do it. <laughs> Do it. Oh my gosh. Wow. She's going to come back and haunt you. She's going to walk. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah is, I mean, it's beautiful there. It's crazy though. Like, did they ever go under any type of paranormal investigation? Do you know? Oh, I am sure that they did. I mean, because like I said, the, the great nieces and some of the people that lived there said that there was a woman that would come into the bedroom and pull the cover over the child and kiss them oh. and tap and pat the pillow. And it, it was mysterious. Even if she was friendly, I still would pee my pants. <laughs> that would be for sale by owner <laughs> no we're not staying here anymore oh my god oh it's crazy yes i know i know it's